Hello and welcome to this month's Aslan Avionics webinar. Um, presenting this webinar today is James Buck. He's our Director of Flight Operations for Aspen Avionics. Just a little bit about James before we get started. James is a retired Marine Corps aviator serving 25 years of active duty. He has served three deployments to the Persian Gulf and Iraq flying CH-53 helicopters off the USS Caraway and the USS Boxer. He is also an accomplished flight instructor training new Marine Corps, Navy, Coast Guard, as well as, inter as, well as international students in the T-34C and the King Air 200 at the Naval Air Station in Corpus Christi, Texas. Additionally, he served four years as a Post Depot maintenance test pilot for the T-34C, King Air 90, and the King Air 200. For the past 10 years, he has logged over 2,200 hours flight testing all Aspen Avionics products as the chief test pilot and as one of two staff test pilots. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Please use the Q&A icon in your Zoom client to submit questions. Uh, please do not use the chat feature. We'll be answering questions live throughout the webinar thanks to Michael Studley, our Director of Field Service Engineering and our Northeast Midwest Regional Sales Manager. We will also record this webinar and we'll send a link to all registered attendees no later than tomorrow afternoon. It will also be available on, Aspen, on Aspen's Evolution Video Library, which is located on our website on the Aspen Avionics homepage. James, it's all to you now. Thank you, Craig. Welcome, everybody. Appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening. What we're going to talk about today, we'll do a, a quick Aspen system overview of our current product line. We'll go over some cool features that you may or may not know about. We'll also go over a few tips. Now, the cool features and tips are things we've gleaned from the last several shows we've, we've been, been at. We'll go over compatible autopilots with the Aspen systems. Of course, we have to talk about some current promotions we have running right now. And then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. As Perry mentioned, if you have questions now, you can type those in the Q&A session box. And Mike Stelter will be answering those. And what we'll do at the end, we'll get to any questions. We'll answer any questions that Mike didn't get to, or maybe we want, need to expound on a few questions that Mike, Mike already answered. Now, before I get started, though, I want to go back to this first screen and some of you may or may not have seen. This picture here really encapsulates what Aspen Avionics is all about. And no, I'm not talking about this Aspen 2500 Max system here. I'm talking about the center stack. This center stack is very important to talk about. Up top here, is an NGT 9000 transponder from L3. In my opinion, the best ADSB transponder out there, but it really doesn't matter. You could have a GTX 34, 345 here. You could have an Avidine Skytrax uh, transponder here. You could have an older analog transponder paired with a GDL 88 or a Free Flight Ranger box. Really, really doesn't matter to ask because we're gonna do everything in our power to make sure you have traffic and weather from those ADSB products, you know, from those ADSB units on our displays. Right below that is the PSE Engineering. I think this is a PMA 450. I love the intelligent audio on this audio panel. But once again, this could be an Albanite audio panel, a Garmin audio panel, or anyone else's audio panel. We're gonna make sure you get the max, the new max callouts through your headsets through, through that audio panel. Below that is a pair of GTN 650s. Uh, this aircraft started its life with a pair of non-WAS 430s upgrade to 430Ws. I was actually going to put a couple of IFD 440s in here, but I got such a sweet deal on an operator who did not like to touch screen to the 650s, I want some 430s. But, so, so the thing, it doesn't really matter. 430, 530, 430W, 530W, GTN 650, GTN 750, the newer, smaller uh, uh, Garmin, uh, the new smaller Garmin GPS units as well. Avidine 440, 540, 550, older analog, uh, older analog GPS systems really doesn't matter to us. We're going to make very, we work very hard to make sure all those systems integrate seamlessly with our Aspen displays. Then right below that out of sight is the awesome Avidine DFC 90 autopilot, which I believe is the first digital autopilot available for general aviation aircraft. Um, working perfectly well with the Aspens here. But this aircraft starts life with a 55X. That being said, STEC 30 all the way to the new 3100 is going to work really well with the Aspen systems. All the older King autopilots, Sentry autopilots, Cessna autopilots all work great um, with the Aspen systems. And then do GFC 600 as well. 
So if you remember nothing else in this next uh, 60 minutes or so, the word integration. Aspen is a display manufacturer works really hard to make sure everything you have currently in your panel or want to put in your panel in the future are going to work seamlessly with the Aspen displays. So don't let someone tell you when you're going in there that you have to you have to go with all one product to make this work because shops have been doing this for over a decade to make sure all the stuff works seamlessly. And remember, you're the PIC, you're the PIC of your aircraft. You don't lose that, you don't lose PIC authority once you go to the avionics shops. Don't let them tell you what they think you need to do. You should go in there with a good idea of what you want. And you can hand pick the best of the best of all these other manufacturers and work perfectly well in the Aspen displays. Okay, so let's jump right into it. The first thing we want to talk about, obviously, is our flagship unit. That's the Evolution Pro Max PFD. Now, the Aspen Pro systems have been around for over a decade. And what we've been doing is we've been doing software updates to add new features and options to our displays. Well, we got to a point several years ago that we can know the hardware would no longer support some of the great things we want to do in the future. So the Pro Max is really the first complete hardware update in the Aspen displays. We maintain the same form factor, but we've got this new piece of glass that's better anti-glare capability. We have a new graphics card. The original graphics card had 16, 16 color combinations. This new graphics card has 16 million color combinations, which makes things like the synthetic vision and our nav map just pop out so much nicer. Along with that, we have a new processor. That process, the new processor is four times as fast as the old processor. And what that does for you, when you have synthetic vision or traffic or weather, and you're doing dynamic maneuvering, that processor just makes sure everything's running smooth, uh, very smooth without any ratcheting at all in our display. We also have a new AHARS and ADC sensors. These sensors are much thinner than the original ones from 10 years ago and run much cooler. So what all this equates to is more processing power for future feature, you know, future features and options and new other, and other things we're working on at Aspen in the lab as well. I kind of touched on the visual enha feature enhancements. If you ever get a chance to go to one of our big shows like Oshkosh or Sunathon, we have this awesome demo unit showing a leg dis legacy display side by side with a max display running through the same flight profile. And you can really, really see the difference. The legacy displays are nice displays, don't get me wrong, but these maxes blow them out of the water with this new hardware. Of course, in retaining the same form factor, these systems are also plug and play with our legacy display. So if you're a legacy customer and thinking about upgrading to a Max, it really plugs into the same, the same connectors. The only difference is the Max have audio, audio outputs now. So your shop will have to run one wire from your existing connector to the audio panel to get those new call outs, which we'll talk about in a minute. The new Max systems are compatible with both the STEC 3100 and GFC 600 autopilots now. And these two items in red, we'll touch, we'll touch more in a minute, but two, these two big features, the backup battery technology and the dual-aided AHARs, which was you know, made possible by this new processor, AHARs AEC sensor, these two items together are now allow the, the Pro Max PFD to be installed without a backup PFD, without a backup uh, added indicator, excuse me. And I'll touch base on that a little bit more in the future here. Of course, uh, the step above that is the Evolution 2000 2500 Max systems. Now, because of those new features, the dual aided AHARs and upgraded battery, the MFD 1000, which is this display here, is now a complete legal backup to a, a Pro Max PFD 1000. So that means you can install these two displays and remove your entire six pack at this point. I've got a picture of a panel here uh, in, in a future slide. And of course, we also have the 1500 system. The, 15, the 1500 system is a PFD 1000 paired with MFD 500. The big difference between the 500 MFD and the 1000 MFD is that the, the MFD 1000 has its own separate AHAR. So if anything happened here, you literally just press this rev button and this becomes a backup PFD. Of course, we also have a really nice entry level um, flight instrument called the EFI, the E5. Now the E5 has all the same hardware as a Pro Max and we actually introduced all this new hardware in the E5 first, in fact, about a year and a half or two years before we released the Max. So all that hardware that's in the Max system is also in the E5. So that being said, 
when you install an E5 in your in your aircraft, you do not need a backup attitude indicator either when you're using an E5. The E5s are fully IFR certified as long as you pair them in a, a panel mounted IFR GPS. So you can shoot LPBs, ILSs all day long with an E5. Like I like our other systems, they are compatible with legacy avionics as well. And these can also drive King of Century autopilots. You now you may need you will definitely need an ACU, which is an analog converter unit. What that does, that converts the digital heading and nav information from the Aspen display to analog, so your autopilot can stand can understand it. And then also, if you want to remove that, if you want to remove that backup attitude indicator that's driving those autopilots, we have another box called EA100. What the EA100 does, it, it turns the digital attitude information in the Aspen into analog, so the autopilot can understand it. Now, there's some other nuances we'll talk about in, in a minute here. D5 with the release of 212 also now has selected altitude um, and indicated airspeed climbs for the Trio and the Bennix King or True Track autopilots. And we'll talk more about those in a minute as well. And then since the E5 shares all the same hardware as a Pro Max, it is fully upgradable to a Pro Max just via software, which is huge. So think you want you want to install a Pro Max and you look at the, the cost of the equipment and the installation, it might be a little prohibitive. Well, you can save half your money now, install an E5, and then upgrade to a Pro Max later. For instance, if you buy the E5 at $5,000 and the Pro Max is $10,000, you just pay the price difference between the two units and we make it a Pro Max. Pretty, you know, we don't gouge you, we don't charge you twice for anything. So really, really handy, a really, really great deal. So what are the differences between the E5 and the Pro Max? Well, first off, the E5 cannot have synthetic vision. The E5 cannot have angled attack. The E5 does not display ADSB traffic or weather. The E5 can only talk to one G, can only have one GPS input and one VLO input. So if you have a dual, say you say you have dual 430s, you're only going to be able to talk to one of those 430s of the E5. So the E5 may not be the best, best option for you. The E5 doesn't have bearing pointers, and the E5 does not have flight director capability. And this is important, which I'll talk about in a bit. But say you have a King Autopilot with flight director. Well, if you want to put an E5 in there, you have to keep the backup attitude that has the King Flight Director on it. Well, this particular E5 is shown with the optional advanced feature unlock, but what that gives you is true airspeed, outside air temperature, winds aloft, and your GPS loss investigations. Now, this is a, a roughly $500 unlock. So if you're buying the E5 now with a full intent to upgrade to a Pro Max later, <laughs> I wouldn't, I would advise not doing this because these are standard features on the Pro Max and it's an optimal feature on the E5. Okay, on to the first cool feature. And this is the emergency RSM, RSM GPS. And this has been part of the Aspen systems with the legacy displays. So it is available in the Legacy Pro and the Pro Max, but not the E5. And what this does, the emergency RSM GPS automatically activates when it senses a loss of GPS input. So here you're looking at all three displays. You've got these amber GPS enunciations. Those mean you've lost GPS input. Then you've got this RSM GPS reversion, the merch use only message on all three displays as well. So what happens, what the Aspen's doing now is it's going to retain all the waypoints that were part of the active flight plan before that GPS system failed. So if you look here, it'll be on any, any, any of the displays, the nav map, also the PFD over here as well in the HSI. But all those fixes are going to remain. So you can have, you, know, you can still navigate. So you might, you're in IFC, you've lost your GPS systems. You can still navigate along your, your, your planned route of flight and hopefully get to BMT conditions. Now it's important to note that on your HSI, the deviation bar is going to be removed because the R, emergency RSM GPS is not the same tolerance as the loss or an IFR kit of the GPS. But you can still navigate roughly along those route of flights by using by using the white lines. Now you can't change waypoints. So there's no way to enter a waypoint. So you got AWOSH and LG Pegma in the Santa Fe. You're not going to be able to change those at all uh, because there's no way to enter them. And you can't shoot an approach in this mode either because your deviation indications are removed. But the idea here is to buy you time along your pre-planned route of flight. To get you know break out your backup radio, talk to center, and trying to get and try and get to vectors to BMT conditions. Also, I'm sure if you've done a good pre-flight study, you know going to Santa Fe might be all IFR, but hey, down here is VFR, 
So this nav map is still going to show you everything, and you can still navigate basically down to the south and find VFR conditions. This I challenge you, this is something you can practice. So on your next flight with your instructor, load up a flight plan, and then you know activate the flight plan, then turn off GPS and see how this works. And you know practice this in VFR conditions with an instructor. Because what happens to you in actual IMC, that's no, that's not the time you want to figure out how this stuff works. But you find it's very easy to do, and it's much better than, than just kind of flying blind and hope that you don't bounce into these mountains here in the Southwest. Okay, next cool feature is synthetic vision of the flight path marker. Uh, these have been around for a while as well, available only with the Legacy Pro and the Pro Max. And as I mentioned, you can't have this on E5. But this provides three new PFU views. You've got SV1, which is a full screen, so you'd have synthetic vision on the top and the bottom of the display in your HSI. You have SV2, which is my personal favorite, so I have synthetic vision on my attitude indicator, but I have a blacked out HSI in the bottom where I can put weather and traffic. Or for single display customers, SV3 might be the best because you have synthetic vision on top, and then on the bottom, you're gonna have a, a terrain map, and also, you can also put traffic on there as well. As well. So synthetic vision is really designed, think low visibility, your IFR, your marginal VFR, your night VFR. It's a great tool for obstacle and terrain avoidance. When I was in the military, we flew a lot from, I was based in Miramar in San Diego. We did a lot of training up at Camp Pendleton. And inadvertently, every time when we come back, we see in the evening, we had to deal with that marine layer. So, we're above, so of course we had night vision goggles, and so we're above the marine layer. We can see everything with our night vision goggles. And when we enter the marine layer, coming down for approaches, we have forward looking for red. These are two very expensive uh, components that you don't see in general aviation aircraft. So the next best thing is synthetic vision, because this is going to be give you a really good representation of terrain and obstacles when you're when you're in the goo. So really, really handy. The flight path marker. There seems to be a lot of confusion with the flight path marker. When you're flying, you're typically canted, and you know you're you're making you have some type of wind correction to maintain your course. So your nose might be pointing you know 10, 15 degrees out, depending on, on the direction you're going, depending on the strength of the wind. But a flight path marker is telling you where you're actually going at all times. So this is a really, really good tool to avoid obstacles and terrain. It's typically green, so if there's nothing going on and everything's hunky dory, this flight path marker is green. But once it senses you're within 45 seconds of an obstacle terrain, it's going to turn amber, and you're going to get this message here, caution obstacle or caution terrain terrain. If you ignore this for some reason, you keep proceeding on, within 30 seconds of the, of the impact, you're going to get the warning terrain terrain or warning obstacle obstacle that's going to turn red. So really, really handy tool. There were several times when I was flying in Southern California, you know, controllers are busy. It's busy airspace, so they give you a vector they tend to forget about you. So having synthetic vision is really, really important. To, at least it was to me. And I've, I've gone into Palomar and, and the Marine Liars well, several times as well. Having this as a bat, you know, to build my essay to make sure I understand what, what's around me is really, really, it's a really good, brings up your comfort level quite a bit. It's like I said, controllers get busy. They put you on a vector, forget about you. And so you can see this stuff and before it becomes an issue, hey, you know, you know this is three Victor Golf and I get a vector that, uh, for traffic or terrain or terrain or obstacles, something like that. So really, really powerful tool. Also, on your next next time you're shooting approach, if, especially if it's a strong crosswind, or even if not, if you notice if you've got the if you've got your uh, lateral and vertical deviations lined up, the flight path marker is going to be pointed right down the runway. So that's just another good SA builder. You know, everything's working out right. The runway, you know, the runway is showing up on synthetic vision right where I think it should be. And when I pop out, that's what I'm going to see. So it's a, really, it's a really, really powerful tool. If your day BMC, synthetic vision still has its uses, especially for traffic, if you have traffic overlay, because traffic's going to pop up above or below the horizon. So when you, if traffic's way out there in the distance, you know exactly where to look for. It's so really, really handy there as well. Synthetic vision also has two different views. It has a narrow field of view and a wide field of view. So if you look here, if you look at your display, you see the five degree pitch ladders and this narrow fan, that's your narrow field of view. Or if you see 10 degrees and a wide fan, that's your wide field of view. So when would you use it to? Uh, we'll, we'll go back to the marine layer uh, idea. Marine layers typically, at least in my film, is typically pretty smooth. So in smooth there, 
the narrow field of view is really, really nice. You know, you know think an IMC again, because it, it, could, it really focuses your picture, makes it a, a, a narrower picture, so it's much more focused on where you're going. However, if you're in the Midwest where I'm from and you're flying IMC, you're typically near a thunderstorm, so you're getting the tar beat out, you're getting bouncing around pretty good. So the movement of the narrow field of view might be a little annoying. In that case, you'd want to go to the wide field of view. Well, those are just two ideas. Um, but next time you're flying, you know, it's very easy. You go to the, you're right on the hotkeys, about you know, your page three or three on the hotkeys, and you can cycle through these different views. Try them out, see which one you like. And, you know, try it, you know, actually try it, try the, try the narrow and, and rough air and see what, the, and see what I'm talking about. You'll find, you'll find you'll probably want this, the wide field of view. Also, there's a time when this flight path marker turns white, and that's if you're going to a chartered airport. So, say you're you're, you're going to your home airport that's it's, it's in the it's in your GPS system. It's going to turn white, and what that does is just giving you a reduced alert, so you're not getting all sorts of false alerts when you're coming to land. Now, if you're one of our backcountry pilots and you're going to some strip that's not charted anywhere, um, if you you can inhibit synthetic vision alerts. Otherwise, that thing will be chirping at you the whole time. You, you know, you need all the the, up to, the terrain, the terrain and caution and warnings all the way down. So you can inhibit this. But just make sure when you're away and you're going back to a paved surface, it's a charted runway to turn it back on. Okay, the next cool feature is angle attack. Um, I really like this. This is an optional feature that's introduced to the legacy displays, and now you know it's also available in the max displays. And that being said, if you bought and calibrated angle attack with a legacy display, it's going to transfer over to the max. You're not going to have to repay. You're not going to buy it again to recalibrate. It'll just transfer over. So really, really nice. Um, so some background on this. Back in 2018, well, 2017 was a horrible year for general aviation. So in 2018, the FAA did a study, and they revealed there was one loss of control fatal accident every four days in general aviation. That's a huge huge number it's just staggering and so they came up with a couple of recommendations and one of those recommendations was to introduce or reintroduce angle attack to general aviation pilots and i say that i mean when we're in flight school and you're learning everyone understands or gets taught the concept of angle attack but there aren't really any there weren't really any good angle attack indicators for general aviation aircraft there's basically three types of angle attack indicators the, the most, the best and most accurate are, you'll see on military aircraft and commercial aircraft, and that's a probe sticking out of the wing or, the, or alongside the fuselage with a weather vane, basically, at the end of the probe. That thing's tied into the flaps, flap indication system, so it knows what your flap position is, and it's it's actually getting a direct measure of angle attack at any given point, so it's giving you the, the pilots in the cockpit a really good representation of angle attack. The other extreme of that was introduced several years ago. And those are pressure, those are pressure differential angle attack indicators. You've probably seen those it'll be a probe sticking out of the wing of a general aviation aircraft. It's got a small pinhole in the front, another small pinhole in the back. And it's measuring pressure differential to give you angle attack. The problem with that indicator is you can only calibrate in, in wings up or flaps up or flaps down. And you have to calibrate really for the instructions, you have to calibrate with flaps up condition. So it gives you a really good uh, AOA indication of your flaps up, but when your flaps down, it's giving you an ultra conservative uh, angle of hack indication, which is why I think a lot of people didn't re or general, in general aviation didn't think a whole lot of it. What Aspen did is we worked with the Italian Space Agency and we looked, they, together we looked at all the inherent inputs of the Aspen display and we developed a way to give you angle of hack Without, without a probe. So it's all software derived. It's a really, really powerful tool. And plus we give you both the clean flaps up condition and the flaps down condition. So this is a really, really accurate angle attack indicator. Still, there's a lot of pushback in the civilian community about angle attack, or at least in general aviation pilots. And I do believe that's because there wasn't a good indicator, as I mentioned. As a military instructor teaching, teaching pilots in the T-34, we start off new pilots just, just like civilian pilots. We fly the numbers. We beat these numbers into their head and make sure they fly the numbers around the pattern. Once they have that figured out, then, then we, we we transition to the angle of attack for a, for a couple of weeks and we do nothing but fly angle of attack. We tell them to ignore the numbers 
and fly angle attack. And they'll fly, they'll fly at 30, you know, 30% above stall all the way around the pattern, just flying angle attack. Once they've got angle attack down, we transition them back, primarily using airspeed and using angle attack just kind of as a reference. When we find the stages of their landings and their, their ability to handle the aircraft in the pattern greatly improve. So at Aspen, we're not advocating you do angle attack approaches like we teach in the military. We want you to fly the numbers as you're taught, but use angle attack as kind of a back as, well, not, as a backup to make sure you, you've got that proper stall margin. You look in our angle attack indicator, if you're down there in the blue, you've got plenty of lift. When you get up in the, into the green, you're approaching right here, which to me is the sweet spot, the green to yellow transition, that's 30% above stall. And that's really where you want to be coming over the numbers on short final. Right here, um, as you get into the upper part of the yellow band, right here is about 10% above stall. And we find that our backcountry pilots like this because they're going to the really, really short strips. And they're typically coming at 10% of the bus stall, but we're telling you to make sure, you know, the rest of us near mirror, mirror motor pilots uh, use this 30% of bus stall. And then somewhere here in the black, in this black hash mark area, is where the stall is going to occur. And to calibrate this is really, really simple. So if you want angle attack on when your Aspen displays, you tell your shop, hey, I want to order, I want to order angle attack. We send them a, a, an unlock card that goes right in here. They unlock angle attack. Uh, they'll put in your max gross weight of your aircraft, your basic empty weight of the aircraft. You're going to put the weight as close as, as accurate as you can get to of the weight you're going to of the aircraft when you calibrate. Then all those all the required speeds are going to transfer over. Once that's done, you go up and one morning to smooth air. It's really important to do this in smooth air. You'll fly a minute and a half at BA, a minute and a half at VS times 1.3, then a minute and a half at VSO times 1.3. From there, the Aspen learns your lift curve, and it doesn't matter what your weight is, what your center of gravity is. We're going to give you a really accurate depiction of angle attack. And this one, as I mentioned, this is the flaps up indication, and this is the flaps down indication. So whatever your flap configuration is, you just look at the appropriate needle. And of course, if you're intermediate in flap somewhere, then you kind of interpolate somewhere between those two, and that's going to give you a really good angle attack indication. So where is the, the, the majority of the problems of these loss of control fatalities are on that base to final turn. So you think about your flying, you're flying your downwind, you misjudge the winds, and you roll out on you, you roll out on final, you end up over here and you're supposed to be here. So you roll a 30 degree angle bank. Now most pilots know or should know what their their wings level straight ahead stall speed is. And they know if you, as long as you stay, you know. Within that standard rate turn, it's not going to increase that much. But when you go from 30 to 45, that stall speed increases a lot. And this is where this comes in. So when you're turning that base to final and you're tempted to roll past 30 to 45 to, just to save the landing, look over here, look over here, see where that needle is. If that needle is up here somewhere, you're going and you roll already and you roll further past 30 to 45 you're gonna stall that aircraft low to the ground. So that's really what this is designed for. That being said, there's some excellent videos made by Mr. Phil Borger on the Aspen website. And this is not just for base to final stalls. That You can use this to scan on your takeoff to make sure you avoid a power on stall. If you're doing a long final and you know, you're trying to stretch that glide, you can also show as an indication of a power off stalls. And Mr. Phil Boyer made some really good videos. He shows you a power on, a power off and a, and a base to final turn, all using uh, saw, all using these um, the Aspen indicator. Once you finish your calibration, you don't have to take this aircraft to a stall if you're not comfortable with. What you do need to do, what we what we need to do though, is once you've done the calibration, we want you to you know clean up the aircraft, go to the stall warning or the buffet, and you want to make sure the upper indicators here in this, in this black to yellow cross hatch area. And do the same thing, get the aircraft in full flaps landing configuration, and then bring the nose up and make sure once again you get that buffer to that first stall warning indicates the stall warning horn somewhere up here. If it's down here somewhere and the horn's going off, you need to recalibrate it. Um, I haven't seen that before. It's really, if you, it, we just need to verify that everything's working. But once again, if you're interested in angle attack, 
the first thing I do is find an instructor that's comfortable with it. And I think it's they're, they're slowly coming around, especially as, as much attention as the FAA is bringing, bringing about it. So flight instructors are now being introduced more to angle attack, not just from a concept, but from a display as well. So really, really handy tool. I think you'll find this, you know, if you're on the fence, I think you'll find this, this is a really, really handy tool, especially in those slide zones based on final turns. Okay, so this is the first full cool feature introduced to the Max displays. So if you're a current customer and have a legacy display, you're probably you're, you're painfully aware that when you install a legacy display, you have to maintain your backup attitude indicator. And that's because the legacy Aspens are very dependent on indicated airspeed for their AHAR solution. So now this, you would be, have to have a really bad day to, make, to see this on your a legacy display. Because one, you'd have to get into icing, you know, inadvertent icing, and your pitot tube frozen over. And two, you'd have not to pre flight your pitot heat, your, your pitot heat, so your pitot heat's not working, you can't clear it. So really, this is the kind of a dual failure, which is rare. However, Aspen recognizes a single point of failure. So we've been trying to figure out how to, how to resolve this. And with the max systems, we were able to. So what we do now, so say you've got in, into icing inadvertently, your pitot heat's frozen up, you didn't pre flight your pitot heat, and, and now you, you've gone to what's called attitude degraded, but it does this automatically without any pilot input. So what we do is once we recognize the loss of indicated airspeed, we transition using GPS ground speed to maintain your AHAR solution. It's called degraded mode because it's not gonna be as accurate as if when we use indicated airspeed. However, as long as you do, you think about this, your IMC, do normal IFR maneuvers, standard rate turns, normal climbs of descents, you're not going to see a difference. That being said, in our AFMS, we specifically call out that if you're in attitude degraded mode in IMC, you need to do half standard rate turns and shallower points of descent. It's very important that you relay this information to the controller. Because think about it, if, if you don't tell him anything, and he's trying to vector you on to a final approach course, he's going to expect you to do standard rate turns and, and, and descend and descend at, at extreme rates. So if you tell them, hey, you know, I, I've got a pedo, I've got a pedo system issue. I need half standard rate turns and shallow points of descents. That helps him understand when he's lining up for when he has to line you up for final. He has to give you turn sooner or descend you sooner. So very, very important that you let him know that. Now, say you get this message, you, you get you get an inadvertent icing, and you get this message, you turn your pedo heat on, you, you're a good pilot, you pre fly that pedo heat. And if pitot heat clears that ice, this is going to go right back to normal mode. So just leave your pitot heat on. So this is an indication that you've got a pitot stack issue. So imagine now you're flying along in the fall. You take off from your home airport. Everything's hunky dory. You climb up and you get about ten thousand feet or whatever you know, whatever altitude you're choosing as a reference. You get this attitude degrading. Like, well, that's weird. It's clear as clear a million out here. You fly to your destination. You start descending down, and the attitude degraded message goes away, <laughs> and you, you land. So you call up your you call up yourself. Oh my, my Aspen's broken. Well, no, no, no. Your Aspen is not broken. This is telling you something's going on with their pedo system. So in this scenario, think about it. You take off, and it's you know it's temperatures above freezing. You get to an altitude that's below freezing, and this and, and you get this. That means somewhere in your in your pedo system you've got water, and it's freezing. When you're about below freezing, as you descend down to the warmer temperatures, it goes away. And the reason I point this out is this actually happened to a customer this last fall. So if that happens in BMC, you really want to get that PO system cleared out. Also, if you get this intermittently in the file, that can mean you have a kink in your PETA line, a hole in your PETA line, or you just have a bad connector. So really, this is not a failure of your aspen. This is telling you something's going on with that PETA system. So make sure you get that checked out. Now, attitude degraded, you cannot test out. You know, you know, in our test aircraft, we can we can do all sorts of crazy stuff. But one of them is is, 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 is simulate a blocked pedo system. So that's how we test it. For you, the best thing you can do is next time you're with your instructor, say you're getting vector for approach, ask ask the controller, hey, can I get half standard rate turn just to see how just see how much longer it takes you to do these turns? That's probably the best way to do it. And if you haven't done that before. You should probably do that anyway, because there'll be other situations where you need to do half standard returns.
Okay, the next cool feature introduced with the Max looking for audio call out. And this, you know, this makes the Aspen, now Aspen is your co-pilot. So you've got a really good co-pilot, you're in the cruise field aircraft now. So the first call I want to talk about is the altitude. So you're cruising along and you're told the climber to send an altitude to your bugs. In this case, you've got 7,000 feet bug. Now, whether I'm climbing to or descending to 7,000 based on the rate of climber descent, a, a few hundred feet prior, I'm going to hear the word altitude in my headset. That's my clue. Look here at my altimeter. Okay, I'm coming up on it. So you know, shallow out your rate of climb and continue on. And then when you hit 7,000 feet, you're going to hear the word altitude again. So once again, that draws your attention to the altimeter. Okay, I'm at 7,000 feet. Let's get the aircraft trimmed up for hands off flight and carry on about our business. Now, as you're cruising along at 7,000 feet, if you deviate more than 200 feet above or below 7,000 feet, you're going to hear the word altitude again. That's your cue. Look down to your altimeter, you know, get, get back on 7,000 feet. And it's really designed to prevent you from getting a violation from ATC. Also, not to pick it here, but if you're familiar with the Aspen, you can also you can also bug your minimum on your approach. So you, you've got a hot key here on the first one. This is two of two on, on page one. You have a minimums hot key, and you can bug in the minimums from your approach plate. Now, as you're coming down about 100 foot prior, you're going to hear approaching minimums. And then once you hit minimums, you're going to hear minimums, minimums. So once again, like I said, Aspen is being a really good co-pilot helping you out. You've got your back. You've got your back. On top of that, as I mentioned earlier about the synthetic vision, as this flight path marker turns from green to amber or amber to red, and you get this message here, you're also going to hear caution, terrain, terrain, caution, obstacle, obstacle, warning, terrain, terrain, warning, obstacle, obstacle for your headset. It's a really, really powerful tool. Once again, this is by flying a cruise air aircraft now, because Aspen's got your back with these call outs. Also, if you have a multifunction display paired with your PFD and you've got a timer set for a fuel leg or et cetera, and that timer expires, you're gonna hear the word timer in your headset. So that's your cue, go to your MFD, scroll to the timer page, see which timer expired. You know, if it's a fuel, if it's a fuel thing and you need to switch tank, turn your pump on, switch your tank over, turn your pump off, go back and reset the timer, go back to your normal business. So these audio call-outs are really, really nice features that makes your aircraft like a crew, like a crew served aircraft. Really, really nice, as long as you set the bugs. Okay, the next cool feature is introduced to the MAC systems is, are the, is the altitude intercept dart. And these were, you know, you'll see these in higher end aircraft, you know, commercial aircraft, corporate jets. Um, but this is the altitude intercept dart. This is a really, really handy tool for situational awareness. So imagine you're flying along and ATC tells you to climb, to climb to, you know, climb to 10,000 feet by a certain fix. So you're about 10,000 feet, you look at your chart, you know, okay, that fix is already, I've already got that fix set. I set 10,000 feet. As long as this arc, and I start my climb, as long as this arc is before that fix, you know you're going to make that crossing restriction. And this works in a climber descent. Um, but if the arc is beyond the fix, you know you've got to either increase your rate of climb or descent to make that crossing restriction, or if you've already maxed out, you've got to tell center, hey, I'm already at max rate of climb. I'm not going to make that crossing restriction. This is important for two reasons. <laughs> the first reason, well, all pilots were afraid of violation, so we don't want to get violated. But more importantly, you've probably got to, uh, you're climbing through a crossing restriction to avoid some type of terrain, so you don't want to hit anything. So make sure you know, fess up early. Fess up early. Hey, I can't make this. I'm already at my max rate of climb. And have them give you a vector, maybe do a 360 in the climb and, and, and come back up. You've got to get ATC involved with that. But one of my favorite ways to use this, typically I used to fly to Centennial quite a bit from Double Eagle. If the weather's good, you know, if the weather's good, I'll typically just fly BFR and I'll get BFR flight following. And the approach control guys in Denver, <laughs> I don't think it ever cleared me to the class B if they know I'm going BFR to Centennial. So I'm always told to remain clear the class B. So what I do here is I, you know, I look at Centennial, I figure out how far the class B shelf is from Centennial. And you can do this with either a Garmin or an Avidine, Avidine Navigator. And I'll make an along track fix here just outside the class B. And then I'll look here, the bottom of the shelf is 9,000 feet. So I don't wanna be at 9,000, I wanna be a couple hundred feet below. So I'll bug 8,700 feet. I'll start my descent, I'm doing a nice little over 500 foot, 500 foot per minute descent. And look at here, I'm gonna be 
right at that class B shell, 8,700 feet. So no chance, no, I'm gonna be well below the, the class B. So this is a really great way to use this. Another good way to use this, and say you're, going, you're entering a pattern in a, non, in a non towered field that you're unfamiliar with. So, if you know you're going to enter the pattern from the side you're coming from, you know, bug 500 feet above pattern altitude, maybe three, and do this about maybe three to five miles out in a long track fix, and descend down. That way, you're out there, you're five miles out, you're 500 feet above pattern altitude, it gives you a chance to look around, see who's in the pattern, and descend down. If you know you've got to overfly the field, well, descend a thousand feet above pattern altitude. Go three to five miles out using it using the long track fix. You know, get down there, overfly the field a thousand feet, you know, get a good bird's eye view of what's going on, who's in the pattern, and you do your entry on the other side. There's probably a couple other good ways to use this, but really, if you if you have a max, if you have, have a max display now, you know, try this out. It's a really handy tool. And this works on the nav map and also on the PFD as well. Right now, you'll see the PFD is is, is zoomed in to about five nautical miles. And this is really out to 40 or so. So as long as you have the, you know, as long as you have this range out properly, you'll see that along track fit for, for the uh, altitude intercept arc as well. A really, really cool tool. Okay, I'm doing a couple of tips. When we get a lot of questions about the bat the, the backup battery in the Aspen system, but the key thing to note is the Aspen system is constantly monitoring your le aircraft electrical system, looking for over voltage, or under voltage, or no voltage. And if we notice something's going on, we're going to automatically switch to, to the battery power for you without any, without any input from the pilot. So these batteries should be checked. I got here before every IFR flight. Really, they should be checked before every flight. I know, I know I'm a pilot now. I know how we get in a hurry. You might, if you're going VFR, you may, you may forget to check this. But at a minimum, please check this before every IFR flight. But for your AFMS, you should check this part every flight. And this is very easy to do. Once the system is booted up, all you have to do is press the menu button here, then scroll over to the power settings, which is typically the second to last page of the menu items. When you scroll there, this external power is initially going to be green and battery is going to be white. All you do is press this hotkey here. This is going to turn the battery to green. You'll get a countdown timer up here. And then in about 10 to 15 seconds, it'll show you your percent power remaining. So as long as you're above 80% charge, you're going to get, we're going to guarantee you 30 minutes of, of, of battery life in extreme hot or cold temperatures. Once you've done that, just press the external power hotkey, go back to external power, press the menu button, and you're done. So what does this mean, extreme hot or cold temperatures? Well, when we test these, we go to a lab and we put these in a chamber that can raise the temperature to extreme hot or extreme cold. And I'm talking temperatures too hot or too cold for you to even be comfortable or even to fly in. So in those extremes, the battery lasts 30 minutes. So what does that mean for you and I? Well, typically I'm flying in a short sleeve shirt or a light jacket. So in normal cockpit temperatures, that battery is going to last roughly 45 to 75 minutes, depending on the percent charge and the, and the, on the, on the age of the battery. So this is something you can, you can check out. And, and so on your next flight, you know, preferably with an instructor, when you get up to altitude, and make sure it's a long flight. So, and the reason for that is you want to have time to charge the battery up when you're done testing it. But just switch, you know, go here, switch the battery power and see how the system works and see how long you have. Um, you'll notice when you do so, your auto brightness, when you go to battery power, your auto brightness is gonna be automatically dimmed down to 40. Because really it's the brightness of the display that runs down your battery the fastest. I challenge you to get in there. When you practice this, press this left knob that's going to make this say manual instead of auto and dial this down even more. Dial it down to a, a brightness level where you can comfortably see it as low as possible to extend that battery life. Now, if you have a multi, say you have an MFD 1000, you know, pilots will think, well, if, if I know I've got a long flight in IMC and I know I've got at least an hour to go and there's an hour's, hour's flight around me is all IMC, what do I do? Well, I'm going to turn that MFD 1000 off. No, 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 no. Do not turn the MFD 1000 off. The re there's two reasons for that. In most installations, the RSM GPS that I talked about is tied to the MFD 1000. So if you turn it off, you've lost that benefit. Number two, if you turn off the MFD 1000, you also lose all those waypoints. So when you turn it back on, it's not going to be there. So for the MFD 1000, crank that down. 
you know, if it's going to be in back, you know, go to battery, crank it down to maybe, you know, something less than 10. So, you, so you know, you can see it's on, but you really can't read it and do that. That extends the life of that battery. So when the PFD gets down to about 10%, start slowly cranking up the MFD 1000. And that's really going to extend your battery life. So if you've got if you've got a dual dual display dual display system, and you're in IMC and you've lost the aircraft electric power, that's the best way to extend your extend the life of the batteries. But this is something you can check, and this is something you can do on your own, or like I said, preferably with an instructor, and test this out. And make sure you have at least an hour flight, um, hour of flight left, and that gives you time to go back to external power and charge these up. If you forget to do that. You can still, you know, once you're on the ground, you can still plug the aircraft in external power, turn on the acid displays, and that will charge it up as well. But this is something you should really, you know, you always want to test these, you know, for these type of emergencies under controlled conditions of BMC with an instructor. So this is something you should really try out before it actually happens to you. Okay, the next one we talk about is the 360 HSI versus the ARC HSI or CDI. So, a lot, so if, if you didn't know, the Aspen has three different compass modes. It defaults to the 360 HSI. So that's what everyone learned on a 360 compass. So that seems to be the most popular. And people are afraid to be, you know, once, they, once they've learned something, they're afraid to try something different. But if you've ever walked on a commercial airliner as you're boarding it and by well, the cockpit door still open, you look in there, you'll typically see those displays in arc mode. So the airline, I think the air, airline pilots know what's going on. So, um, Try this arc mode. What this does is breaks it, it, it expands your, the compass to 100 degrees arc across the top here. So this makes heading control much easier because you've got a bigger representation. Now the arc mode can be in the standard in the HSI mode or the CDI mode. So what would I use it to? Well, if I'm at, if I'm at altitude and terrain and obstacles aren't a problem, I like the HSI representation. So I'll typically fly around the arc HSI. However, if I'm descending into, you know, if I'm descending to an airport that's surrounded by terrain, like Santa Fe, for in this instance, the CDI might be preferable because the CDI it declutters, it removes all the stuff in the center of the display. And so now I have a much better, much cleaner picture of what's ahead of me as far as obstacles the terrain. So two different ways to try, you know, I challenge you to try these out in your, in your next next several flights if you're, if you're a current customer and see which one you prefer. That being said, with the you know the 360 HSI, the Arc HSI, Arc CDI, the non-synthetic vision view, the three you, know, you have three SV views, actually six because you have narrow and, and narrow and wide screen or, or narrow and wide field of view. The a single Aspen PFD has 21, 21 different views that you can choose from. So try these in different parameters of flight to see which makes sense to you. I challenge you next time you're doing an IPC and you have to hand fly an ILS, for instance, you know, try this mode here, this ARC HS, this ARC HSI. Because typically what I do is once I have the wind correction figured out on final, I'll press this knob here that syncs up my heading bug. And I try to make my corrections within the confines of the heading bug in a really, really nice way to fly an ILS. So I'll try this next time you're out with your instructor. Try these different views. Remember, there's 21 of them. Don't get stuck just on the 360 HSI. Okay, checking my time here. I'm going to run through this one pretty quickly because there's some more important stuff I want to talk about. But the key point here is very important are still useful. We joke about being children in the magenta line ever since GPS came out. But using these bearing pointers are really key to make you know to maintain situational awareness. Now I get it, if I've got an MFD here in the, in the approach plate or a nav map up, I'm gonna see exactly where I'm at. But just imagine you are a single display customer and you don't have the benefit of this display here and you've got a paper chart or your approach plate. So if you look here, the number one needle is pointed to FACNO and here it is pointed right off my right wing. And that makes perfect sense, there I am. The number two needle is double bearing needle is pointed back at the at the VOR station. So if I look back here, there's a tail needle. So it's a really, really powerful way to maintain your situational awareness. And I, I fly, I've flown with a lot of pilots and they get lazy because they're so dependent on GPS that they don't even use their bearing needles. Remember there's GPS outages, especially out here in the West, there's always military training areas and they tend to turn GPS or, or descale it or make it not as, um, 
So they, they increase the tolerance so it's not as refined. So you may you may or may not find an area like that, and you're going to apply to fly an ILS. And so you want to be able to use these bearing pointers. Really good practice next time you fly an ILS is don't load it in the GPS system. Just dot, just load, just twist in the or dial up the frequency, but don't load it in the GPS and see if you can fly an ILS uh, old school using bearing needles for reference to your white bridge. Really, really, really good practice. I had to do that a couple of years ago with my instructor, and it really opened my eyes because I hadn't done it in so long. So, you know, and trying to use these bearing needles to do that, it, it, you may have to do it someday for real. So it's good practice to use. One more key point, though, is if you're flying this ILS, having the bearing pointer. So in this case, if you have, if you do load the ILS from the, from the GPS, remember when you roll out on find them, you've got to turn your HSI to, G, to be low. You do that on the navigator. This box here is going to have the ILS information, but it's not going to have these waypoints. So if you have the number one needle, in this case, like I do here, pointed to GPS one, well, now that's going to give you your DME to each waypoint as you go along. So as you pass back, you know, it'll, it'll just sequence in the next waypoints and be right there. So another good reason to use bearing pointers. Okay, GPS steering. This is the number one question we get at all the shows. It was very, you know, if you're new to GPS, a lot of folks understand how to use it. If they don't under, understand the integration between their GPS unit, their Aspen, and their autopilot. I will tell you the most important thing about this discussion is to make sure you understand how your GPS system works. Because really the Aspen in this case is mainly just a display. So you've got to know how to program your GPS system. You've also got to know how to when to press the right buttons on your, on your autopilot. Because the only thing Aspen is doing is adding this function of GPS steering to your autopilot. So you've got to know the basic functions of your GPS system and your autopilot. A lot of words here. I'm going to talk through this. So, and this is predicated. This is, you know, thinking you have a, say you have a single Aspen PFD, a pro, a pro or a pro max that is. You have a, let's call it a King autopilot, an older analog autopilot that doesn't have GPS steering built in. So I think KFC 200, a Century or Cessna autopilot. And just a basic GPS unit, like a 430 or a GTN, whatever the case would be. So imagine we're here, this is where our aircraft is located, and we're cleared direct Dudley for the ILS 22 approach. So the first thing you should do is activate the approach on your GPS unit and make sure you set the CDI course on your GPS unit to GPS. This is important because this, that's where you set that CDI source. And if you do that, the Aspen display, the HSI is going to automatically switch to GPS as well. So you don't have to do it in both places. You do want to verify it, but you don't have to do it in both. Now, I'm going to turn the, I'm going to turn the aircraft in the general direction of Dudley. I'm going to sync up the heading bug and engage the autopilot in heading and alt mode. So in that case, now I'm just kind of driving towards, driving in the general direction of Dudley. And now... I'm going to press the GPS hotkey on the Aspen display, which is on the first, and it's the first menu, the first page of the hotkeys, uh, about two to three down. So you press that. So now what's going to happen is, is magic. You're literally, the Aspen system go, is going to give the GPS steering commands through the heading bug command to your autopilot. It's going to fly you from here to Dudley. It's going to, do, you know, now the GPS system is telling you to enter a parallel. So the Aspen's can command a parallel entry. It's gonna roll out all on final without you doing a thing. Really, really powerful. Now, this is key too. On both the Avidine and the Garmin navigators, you can, auto, you can set that thing to automatically um, switch to VLOC, to auto, automatically tune the ILS and automatically switch the CDI, CDI source to VLOC for you. So that's key. If you haven't done that, read up on how to do that in that GPS navigator and make sure you do that. But so now what's going to happen, if you've done that, the GPS system is automatically going to slew, it's automatically going to switch to VLOC. Now, if it doesn't, you know, if that's your, that's your job as a pilot, make sure you switch it to VLOC. And then on the autopilot, you're going to press the approach mode. Now, once you press approach mode, the Aspen system stops sending GPS commands because the GPS commands only work when the autopilot's in heading mode. 
So now it's going to fly the, the deviations uh, from the GPS system, or, or basically from the B lobe. It's going to, you're going to hit Dudley, it's going to capture glide slope, it's going to fly on down to decision altitude. Really, really nice. Now, once you get down to decision altitude, say you're down there, you get down to 6,017. And remember, I hope that you, you, you bug this so you can hear approaching minimums and minimums on the Astrum Pro Max. But once you get down here, you don't have the field in sight. Well, now you've got to execute your missile approach. So you do your, do your cockpit duties, clean the aircraft up. You kick off the autopod, you know, pitch the nose up seven and a half degrees or so, whatever, whatever the case be for your aircraft and start climbing out. Now, in this case, I'm going to climb up to 6,500 feet before I do anything else. And then at 6,500 feet, I can start a climbing right turn to 7,700 feet back to Dudley. Now at this point, so once I start that right turn, now I can activate the missed approach on the GPS system. And when I do that, it should automatically switch the CDI source to GPS. But once again, you're the pilot, make sure you verify it has switched the source to the GPS. And if it does that, it's gonna automatically switch the Aspen HSI source to GPS. But once again, verify that it happened and then engage the autopilot in heavy mode. So GPSS, you never turned it off, it's already on, so it's back in heavy mode. So now the Aspen is gonna send GPS steering commands and fly, this, fly your aircraft right back to Dudley, pick up the holding pattern and, and then go forward. So really, really powerful tool, GPS steering. If you don't, if, if you're new to it, make sure you sit down with your instructor and map it out with your system. Like I said, this is basically for any King, older King Century or Cessna autopilot, this is how it works. Now, if you have a DSC-90, oh, that's, the DSC-90 is so nice. So if, if I fly a DSC-90, I was here, I would load the approach, and activate the approach in GPS unit, and I'd put the DSC-90 in nav mode. In nav mode, the GPS, the DSC-90 flies, it does the procedure turn. And the cool thing about that is, if I've set the auto, auto ILS on the GPS system, it's gonna automatically, you know, that'll automatically switch to ILS, and the DFC-90 automatically switches to approach mode because it knows it's on an approach. And so from here, once I touch nav mode, I don't touch anything again <laughs> until I'm at missed approach. Really, really nice. I have not had the pleasure of flying a 3100 or DFC-600, but I have to imagine they've incorporated that as well. It's a really, really powerful tool. It makes you, it makes you a little bit lazy. But remember, you've got to manage that. Make sure it's one thing to know what's supposed to happen, but more importantly, you have to verify all the stuff that's happening behind the scene. But once again, if you, if you have an analog autopilot and you're using GPS steering for the first time, make sure you map it out, make sure you understand how it works you know, before you go flying high far. Okay. Um, for those who don't know, we were just, our, our latest software release earlier this year is 212. What that did was, you know, it added this GFC 600 interface, the Aspen displays. It also added, a new feature for everyone. It's only on the MFD nav map of the extended runaway center lines, which is really handy for you know if you're going once again, you're going to an unfamiliar airfield. This you know having the center lines out there really helps you orient yourself. You're getting the left down and right down with your base. And plus, you can roll these things out to three, five, and ten nautical miles, or you can turn, if you don't like them, you can turn them off as well in a minute. So really, really cool new feature as well. As I mentioned, we've also we also well no I didn't mention this, but we do reduce the auto brightness. Um, from 70 to 50 now. Um, that's because the max systems are so much brighter than the legacy systems and the 70% was a holdover from the legacy system. So the 50 is, is, is more than bright enough. You can still manually turn these up brighter if you want to, but you'll find that 50 is plenty bright enough. And in fact, I still I still actually crank mine down to 35 to 40. I'm just saying I think they're still too bright. We've also at, expanded the fault log. Think about it in your, in your modern vehicle, if you have a check engine light, you go to your shop, they plug in a programmer and they tell you exactly what's wrong. And this really cuts down on troubleshooting. Well, we're doing something similar. We're expounding upon this more and more. So if you have, um, say you get some type of anomaly on your attitude indicator, but it clears out, you can land next time your dealer. They can insert a little SD card right here and it downloads all the flight profiles. They send it to field service and they can analyze it and they can see, oh, you know what, your compass is out of calibration. We come you know, recalibrate. You know, the RSM is bad. We need to send you new RSM. You know, something's going on in your display. We need to send you a new display. This just really cuts down people. Oh, let's just throw parts at it. We don't know what the problem is. Let's throw parts. Let's throw parts, which just gets very expensive. So this really helps. And we're expanding it every time we have a new software release. Uh, the field service guys have been asking us for a long time. Engineering incorporates some new features with that as well. 
if you have an EA100, there's a software update. It's not something you as a pilot will see. It's just something inside the, the software engineers notice. And before it becomes a problem, you just have a little fix in there, but you won't see any difference improvement or enhancement with that, but it's just something you should get if you have an EA100. There's also a DOC90 interface improvement. When we went from Pro Max 210 to 211, we were working really hard with Genesis to do a lot of upgrades for the Genesis autopilot. In, in there somewhere, um, something happened with the DFC 90 software where depending on the startup sequence of the DFC 90 and the Aspen display, you would get an AHARS miscompare message. This autopilot would still work if you have this annoying message across your display. So we fixed that with 212. That was on us. <laughs> we, we, you know, we, we looked at it in the lab and found out and we, we corrected that. And as I mentioned earlier, it also adds air rank outputs um, for selected output capture and you can airspeed for both the TRIO and the, and the True Tracker Benefit autopilots. That being said, if you have an original E5, you know, from five years ago, and you're going to use one of these autopilots with this new feature, that E5 will probably have to come back to Aston for some updates um, before it can do that, which isn't a big deal. So while you're installing the autopilot, you can send that in and get that updated for you. Okay, compatible autopilots. This is really important. So our test aircraft, our, our, our Piper Lance 1979, it has a King uh, KFC 200 in there from 1979. And that thing is still running strong. That's an amazing, <laughs> it, 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 it's amazing that autopilot as old as it is, is still running perfectly well. So if you have an older autopilot, don't think you have to upgrade and, and get rid of that and buy something new. These older autopilots still have a lot of great features. And plus when you use the Aspen system, uh, and you get GPS steering, that's really, really powerful. So any of the King Sentry and Cessna autopilots will work with the Aspen displays. Um, if you have a King or Sentry and you want to get rid of the, the, the attitude indicator, you do have the EA100, which I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, the EA100 does not work with a Cessna autopilot, so you would have to retain the vacuum driven attitude indicator for those. And as I mentioned about the E5, remember the E5 does not have flight director. So if you had an older analog autopilot that has flight director, you're either going to have to keep the backup attitude indicator that has that flight director capability because we, you know, the FAA is pretty strict about that. We can't remove features from the autopilot that you've had with admin display. So you've got to you've got to retain those features. So you either keep the old attitude indicator with the flight director, or you have to get a legacy pro or pro max that has flight director capabilities. Next up, all the all the analog S Tech autopilots <laughs> work perfectly well. With all three, with the E5, the Pro, and the Pro Max. The one thing we did several years ago is we made this really, really cool enhanced feature for the 55X. If you want that, if you have a 55X and want that, that can be with a Pro, it has to be a Pro or Pro Max only. And if you have more questions about this one, if you Google Aspen and STEC 55X, there's a video I made several years ago that goes over all the enhanced features. Really, really nice system. Of course, if you're lucky enough to have the Avidon BFC 90, like I had my Cirrus, that's for Legacy Pro or Pro Max only. The 3100, as I mentioned, we've been we've worked with Genesis for probably four or five years. It's a lot of back and forth on that uh, to make to make the software work perfectly. So with the STEC 3100, you do, do need a Pro Max with software version 211 or higher. As far as the GFC 600 is concerned. Um, Garmin did did certify that with the legacy display, but it has greatly reduced features. So if you want all the cool features of the GFC 600, you would need a Pro Max one in software version 2.12. As I touched base earlier, you have Trio, Trio and True Track Autopilots will work with both the Pro Max and the E5, not the legacy Pro, but the Pro Max and the E5. Now the Trio and True Track, if you have a newer E5 or a Pro Max, there is no unlock charge. That's because true, both Trio and True Track used all the uh, the standard protocol, autopilot protocols the Aspen has. The DFC-90, the 55X Enhanced, the 3100, GFC-600, they all have unlocks. And the reason for that is, expect, you know, as I mentioned, all three of these, these took a lot of engineering effort, a lot of back and forth, a couple of years. You know, we we offered, we gave all our standard protocol to have an Genesis and GFC and Garmin. And they're doing some really cool stuff. So, you know, we need, we can you give us this information in a different format? So we go back to engineers and make changes to our software. We would send it to them. They would go through the test profile. 
okay, now we want to do this too. So there's a lot of back and forth. Like I said, this uh, these two especially were four to five year engineering efforts back and forth. So that's why there's an unlock for those. Yeah. Okay. As I mentioned you know, earlier, this is uh, about a 2000 Maxis move. So if, if you don't know who Flyer with Bruno is, you know, look look him up on, on YouTube or, or um, Instagram. He makes a lot of good, you know, make, he makes some pretty funny videos. He makes some more educational videos as well. But this is his two, this is air, his aircraft in 2000 Max and note there's no backup displays anywhere. This is a perfectly legal installation. Really, really great way to clean your panel. But anyway, purpose of this slide is to talk about promotions. So our current promotion is buy one, get one half price. So say you have a legacy this PFD and you want to go to 2000 Max. Well, you'd buy the, you'd pay full price for the Pro Max upgrade. They would sell you the MFT 1000 half price. Or say like Bruno, you didn't have anything. You had a six pack here. Well, you pay full price for the Pro Max PFD and we sell you the MFT 1000 half price. So really, really great way um, to clean up your cockpit and get a 2000 max system. Also, I think I mentioned we're on the five year anniversary of the E5. So what we're doing with E5s is we're rolling pricing back. It's been, I think they're about thousand dollars less than they are. They were thousand dollars cheaper back in 2018. And so we rolled back that introductory pricing. So these are going on at least through Oshkosh. And if you're, you know, if you're waiting for Oshkosh specials, these are our specials that we have for, for Oshkosh. So two great promotions, two great promotions for you. And also, in case you didn't know, we also have legacy remanufactured legacy displays that, that we sell for a really great price. And we also have sales on our class three and helicopter displays as well, if you're interested in those. And so if you are interested, these are the people you need to contact. So if you're in the Western US and Western Canada, that's Mr. Dave Wilcox. If you're in the Northeast, Midwest, and Eastern Canada, that's Mr. Mike Studley, who, by the way, is manning the chat or is manning the uh, QA room right now. If you're in Florida, Southeast, all the way to Texas, that's Mr. Andy Smith. And then if you're anywhere else in the world, uh, mm -hmm. our international sales are Corey Rally. So there's all their contact information. Um, I think that's it. We're, we're going to roll into questions. I'll leave this slide so you can copy this information. But before I hand it over to Mike, there's two things I want to talk about really quick. First one is the GFC 500. The new FAA rules is the autopilot manufacturer has to do the integration. So Aspen cannot grab a GFC 500, do an integration, and, and make it an offer to the world. It has to be Garmin. Garmin and, I, Garmin and Aspen have worked really well together in GFC 600. But as of today, there is no talk of the GFC 500 interface with Aspen display. So if that's something you're interested in, we, we, we please reach out to your Garmin sales rep, tell them what you have, and tell them what you want to do. And if they get enough inquiries for it, I'm sure they'll eventually cave in on GSC 500. Aspen's customer base is over 16,000 customers strong, and I know they want to tap into it and sell some more other products. The next one is if you have an IFD and have an IFD, you've probably noticed at times when you go from one waypoint to the next, that while the Aspen HSI slews them up immediately to the next fix, the data block up there can maintain that original the original waypoint for a while. It takes it takes a while for it to update. We've been working with Avidine on that, and we've found in our lab we have, we can break all the stuff down lab and parse parse out this information. They're sending us the HSI information, but they're not sending us the data block uh, for some unknown reason. They do have a software fix in work right now. They're testing on their end, and they're supposed to send us a copy of it here in the next couple of weeks so we can test it. But hopefully, if, if you notice that issue, hopefully Avidon will have a software release off for that fairly soon. But it, it, once again, the HSI is giving you the immediate information. You just have to ignore the data block for a little while, and you can look at the data on the IP. With that, I'll turn it over to Mike. What do you have? So just a few questions. I guess that means you did a good job on your on what the information that you covered, James. Um, the GFC 500, just to touch on that one more time, uh, we'd love to work with them again. And um, they need to hear the demand from the field. And I have an email address here. It's aviation.sales at garmin.com. It's aviation.sales at garmin.com. Hey, Mike, do, you, you, do you have the do you have the CEO's the Garmin CEO phone number too? I, I would love I would love <laughs> to put that up on a slide here, but I don't. Um, 
if you know enough of us get together and let them know they're going to recognize how much demand there is out there their uh their their position at this point is well just take your aspen gear out which makes no sense whatsoever and that's not being a good neighbor is how i usually word it so hopefully uh enough people get together uh we can get them to change their minds and get going on the uh, 500 because we all want to work on that and if they don't i mean tr trio trio certifications right around the corner so you have there right. are some other great low-cost autopilots at garmin if you can't get the tuc 500 in your aircraft yep absolutely um and then so there was a question on um which systems that you can put in that will allow removal of the vacuum pump and your attitude gyro. And that's the uh, E5, if you're looking for basic IFR capabilities, or the Pro Max, if you want something a little bit more advanced. And if you go up to the 2000, which is a two screen, or a 2500, which is a three screen Max system, you don't need any backup instruments, like James is showing here. This is a 2000 Max. The only backup instrument you need there is a, uh, a standby compass, and uh, an IFR GPS. So it really uh, does a good job clearing the, the old equipment out of the panel, make it look uh, it, a lot more modern. Um, the AOA calibration speeds, the uh, James ran through those pretty quickly. Um, it's important to note that the screen, the Aspen screen will put a, dis a, a prompt on the screen and it'll tell you what speed to fly and it has a countdown timer. Basically, you just follow the instructions on the screen for that calibration of the AOA. It's uh, it's very simple. Yeah, and it's, as, as I mentioned, it's really important to do that in smooth air because if, if you, you, know, you can you can have a shallow, if, if you're descending a little bit too much, you're getting bounced around in turbulent air or you, you're, you're horrible airspeed control, it's gonna kick you out and tell you to try again. <laughs> the cool yep. thing is, say you get through the first two unscathed and you get to the third one and say you're having trouble with airspeed control, it doesn't make you start over. It just makes you do that third step again. But it's 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 looking for you to fly. It's, you know, it, it's it's interesting because as pilots, we can fly. You know, we think about we we fly straight and level all the time. But now, when you've got to focus on it for a minute and a half, it just seems to be a challenge for some people. And you can't use the autopilot. You got got to hand fly it and just make sure you do what you need to do to maintain as stable a platform as possible during that minute and a half. And the last question that I had was a uh, about degraded mode, a question of whether uh, all Max displays have the uh, degraded mode. And yes, they do. Uh, the Max displays and E5s all have that degraded mode. They're watching your back. So if you lose your airspeed, uh, the uh, GPS ground speed will step in for you. And another uh, cool thing I didn't mention, say you're having a really, really bad day. So now you, you're in degraded mode because you have a pedostatic failure. And at the same time, you know, it's funny because you, you think about stuff in the military, we, you know, we got multiple failure fares and sims all the time. It was all about stressing you out with multiple fares, stuff that could never really happen or you think would never happen. But if you have a pro max and, and you're in degraded mode already, so now you're, you're that pedo tube is iced up, you didn't pre flight, it's not working, so you can't clear it. And now you lose electrical power and you lose your GPS system. Now what? Well, guess what? That RSM GPS now provides GPS ground speed to maintain that solution. So it, it's far fetched to get to that point, but that's the stuff our engineers think about. And, you know, what's the worst case scenario? Okay, we've got that. What's one more worst thing that can happen to these pilots? And we've worked through those. So that's, you know, I don't think we really, really I haven't mentioned that in the past five slides or five presentations. It's not came to my attention again. That's just, that's how the, the engineers at our company think. You know, what's the worst case? Okay, great. You give me the worst case. Now, what's the worst case after that? So we think about that. So if you have a Pro Max system and you can have, you can be having a really bad day um, and the Aspen is still pulling through. Sorry, Mike. Back to you. That's okay. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. We're all caught up on my end. So uh, we can wrap it up if you, if you, you're done on your end. Yeah. Folks, we truly appreciate your time. Um, I'll hand it over to Perry for any closing comments. Yeah, I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you for sticking with us on this uh, this evening. So on this Wednesday, Wednesday evening, I will be recording. This uh, webcast has been recorded and I will be able to send uh, a link via YouTube uh, to all registered attendees. Now, whether you were able to attend or you, you couldn't stay the whole 
uh, during the duration of the webinar, I will make sure that you also get a link to the webcast. And with that, I will bid you all good night. Mike and James, anything else? Nope. Thanks again for attending. Thanks again, everybody.